Thank you. Um, one of the nice things that uh, we do each year at the NBN conference is to, to give um, some awards. We have um, presentations to make. And um, this year we have three presentations, which is unusual. Um, and two of these are uh, conferring honorary membership of uh, the NBN Trust. And then there's one um, extraordinary presentation, if I can call it that. Um, so this year we're conferring uh, honorary membership of the Trust to uh, two people. And the first one is someone who will be very familiar, I think, to all of you. And it's our recently retired um, CEO of the NBN Trust, uh, Jim Mumford, who retired in, uh, in May this year. Um, Jim came to the NBN in 2000, having been seconded from uh, Scottish National Heritage, where he had been Principal Grants Officer for some time. He's a marine biologist by training, and he's worked in fisheries management with experiences right across Europe. Coming to the fledgling NBN in uh, the year 2000, Jim was faced with the task of attempting to work across different sectors to develop something completely untried and untested. But it was typical of him as a person that uh, he, he was up for it, he was willing to give it a go. He also had the wise help of the late Sir John Burnett, uh, the first chairman of the NBN Trust, to guide him, not to mention the different perspectives of, brought by the, um, by the founding trustees of, of the NBN. Jim was uh, quite simply the right man at the right time for the job. It required a mix of conviviality, strategic vision, determination, guile and energy. Um, and those of you that know Jim know that that is, that's him in a nutshell. This combination of characteristics was essential when the initial bid for the NBN consortium for funding under the Millennium uh, Commission was unsuccessful. Several partners were doubtful about continuing, but with support from those who believed in the concept, Jim led the reconfiguration of the whole project. Jim developed his own persona in the NBN over the next 14 years. His understanding of the needs of the NBN grew as much as his realization that the NBN Trust's independence was crucial to the success of the NBN. And now with his retirement, the NBN enters a new phase of development, but its potential and capabilities owe much to Jim's time at the helm, for which we're all very grateful indeed. Jim, would you like to come forward? Congratulations, Jim. We stand here and I suppose. <laughs> It's a long handshake. <laughs> this is the longest handshake I've had with Jim, that's for sure. <laughs> oh, sure. Okay, thanks, Jim. Can I say a word or two? Um, quickly. Very quickly. Can I, can, I just, <laughs> can I just thank all of you for the last 14, 15 years, which has been a blast. Thank you very much. Okay. Thanks, Jim. Our second, <coughs> excuse me, our second award of honorary fellowship goes to Mrs. Val Burton, and it's a great pleasure indeed to acknowledge the behind-the-scenes contribution made by Val to what is now the, the, the network. Val's unique role in biological recording in the UK and to the development of the NBN has been the computerization of more than 12 million biological records especially keyboarding data from handwritten record cards and notebooks. During 30 years within the Biological Records Centre, Val has worked with many changes in technology, but always requiring her remarkable ability to decipher and interpret the handwriting of thousands of volunteers associated with the many national schemes and societies. 
Val's work has been specifically acknowledged by the authors of many national atlases and other publications, and it's very fitting indeed that NBN is now able to thank her and celebrate her unique contribution. I'm not sure Val is here. She wasn't, um, she isn't here, is she? So um, let's thank her in her absence and we'll pass on her, her certificate in due course. Finally, we um, have a third one-off presentation that um, has actually been alluded to, um, I think, twice already in this morning's um, uh, talks. Because many of you will have heard that in September this year, we reached the 100 millionth uh, species record on the NBN gateway. And it was a, a two-spot lady beetle, Adelia punctata, recorded on the National Trust's Wimpole Estate in Cambridgeshire and collected by Dr. Peter Kirby. Peter has been an independent consultant entomologist for at least 10 years and has carried out invertebrate surveys for many people, including the National Trust, RSPB, Natural England, and several wildlife trusts. And before that, he worked for the Nature Conservancy Council and at English Nature. This summer, he rediscovered the very scarce tansy beetle, Chrysolina graminis, at Wood Walton Fen in Cambridgeshire after a 40-year absence. He's published dozens of articles and reviews about insects and has also written a very valuable handbook, The Habitat Management for Invertebrates, a practical handbook. So it's with great pleasure that I ask uh, Peter Kirby to come forward and collect his footnote. His footnote? His <laughs> certificate. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about the footnotes. <laughs> Great, and that's for you too. And let's do this handshake business. <laughs> Great. Thank you. The reason I um, said footnote was that I had a footnote. <laughs> So I was a bit ahead of myself. And the footnote was that the current, the, we, we've just celebrated the 100 millionth uh, species record. And uh, since September, it's risen to 102,543,648. Thank you. I'll hand you back to John. Very good. Well, um. It gives me great pleasure to introduce this next speaker. We've, um, with, with support from CEH, uh, SNH in Scotland, uh, CEPA in Scotland, um, we've been able to, and a, and a secret unknown donor, uh, unknown to you but unknown to me, um, we've been able to fund um, Peter Doherty all the way from Canberra to fly here to be with us um, not only today but yesterday for workshops and ne next week we're holding workshops across the UK with specific audiences um, to inspire people about the work they're doing in Australia. So um, Peter's um, uh, born in Northern Ireland, has spent time in Edinburgh and um, he knows this part of the world well but um, it's great to have him here so be please be kind to him when you're having lunch with him uh, even though he's an Australian. Uh, but we'll, um, uh, we'll Welcome, Peter. Come on. Thanks, John. I appreciate that. Um, John did get a bit of a surprise yesterday because uh, I think he originally thought he was really inviting an eminent Australian, <laughs> um, a Nobel Prize winner by the name of Peter Doherty. Um, and his, but his team, uh, Sarah, Mandy, and having met Rachel last night, I wouldn't put it past her. We're going to play a trick and have Pete Doherty, the punk rocker. Um, you've sort of got something in between, I think. Uh, but it's a pleasure to be here. I'm really, really pleased to get the invitation. I mean, certainly enjoying the trip so far, apart from the time zone. And this may well be the first time a punk rocker has appeared in the Royal Society. I don't, I don't know. Um, but fitting that he's been introduced by an Australian. So I'm here talking about the Atlas of Living Australia. It's been quite a grand adventure um, from my perspective and from the Australian perspective. $46 million worth of investment from the Australian government is a direct investment in e-research infrastructure, but as you'll see, it's reaching a wide range of additional audiences. Um, 
I went looking for the pound sign on the Australian keyboard for quite a while, but it just, it just ain't there. So, so I believe that's about 24 or 25, actually I wrote it down, 25 million pounds investment. That's since 2008. So we're a project of partners. Um, we represent the museums and Iberia and Australia primarily, but we've also attracted uh, attention and data um, and support now from a wide range of communities in Australia not unlike here, but we certainly don't have the same cultural context as uh, the history of recording, a cultural recording that, uh, that I see in, in the UK. Uh, so I'm extremely jealous of, of the, um, the networks you have here. We're part of a wider group called ENCRIS, um, sort of name, National Collaborative Research Infrastructure Strategy in Australia. Um, Australian government um, did very well by basically splashing a lot of money around um, as a response to the global financial crisis. And the Atlas was very fortunate to receive 30 million dollars of that uh, directly at that time in 2009. One reason to keep mentioning that is um, we feel like we've been very fortunate to receive that funding and if we're not providing, uh, not producing something of real value then we should have people, lots of people knocking on our door saying why not. Um, so I'll leave that for you to judge. We've done a lot of work to promote open access, open data, um, embrace Creative Commons licensing which we uh, was talked about a lot at the uh, NBN workshops yesterday so that was great. Um, 50 million records, which ain't too bad for, for a country that um, doesn't really have the same culture as here. Uh, we have a lot of different uh, data providers, over 900 there. Uh, our data ranges uh, across a whole wide spectrum, um, and effectively we do a lot with data, um, as you might see. So just a quick tour of the Atlas, for those seen, this is our front page. There's, there's sort of three main things that the Atlas uh, delivers. One is, given a particular species, give me some information about a species. Here's a corroboree frog in Australia. You notice on the, the right there that, um, I'll see if I can figure out this pointer. Um, it's, the taxonomy is loaded in the system and it will prompt you for, um, for a species that you're looking for. Key thing about this is, because we represent the collections, um, the first images of a specimen from a collection, unfortunately it can scare school kids. You've seen a lot of dead creatures, but then of course others might get excited by that. Um, and some images then from communities. The other thing that's here is the context for this particular species in different um, states, or at the national level it's critically endangered, and from New South Wales state level it's also critically endangered, and IUCN. Um, generally in Australia every, it, 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 it's very much state-based. Every state has its own interpretation of what's threatened and what's not. Um, so we have to gather that information up together. This is one of the presents from, from you guys, um, after settlement. So the fox um, is of least concern, as you'll see over here. Um, one, uh, one particular reason to show this one is that it, it demonstrates that infrastructure is worthless without the data. So at the moment, according to our map, the fox stops at the border, and it's obviously not the case. It's just simply that the Queensland government hasn't got to a point yet where the data is fully available. Um, they actually have now progressed that, and we're in the process of harvesting that. But I think it's a critical point um, when, you're, when we're in a context of lots and lots of groups out there providing data, and it's clear if you want to be able to work with data at a national scale and get a full picture of really what's happening to biodiversity, it's just so important that um, multiple agencies and communities um, are engaged and uh, participating. It's a great shame when they don't. So a couple of tools. Um, something that I was reminded of actually in the last 24 hours was we were originally funded to produce e research infrastructure, but there was a moment in time where it was pointed out to us that researchers actually some really like some simple tools, um, thanks very much. They don't really want really complex tools. So we started to build tools that were actually very usable. Um, and this was one of them. And what we found is that these tools have been embraced by primary schools, secondary schools, um, interested field naturalists. I mean, basically, we've, we're reaching the public, a wide community. And what we've found is that people are really responding to the system and the data. So in this case, uh, this is actually where I work, um, which happens to be um, at CSRO in Canberra, next to a university. So we've had scientists crawling all over this land for some time. So in this particular five kilometre radius, there are 6,633 species recorded. Um, and using the system, I can quickly look at uh, just the wattles or the snakes or the frogs or particular species in the area. Um, our original director was Donald Hoburn, who came from GBIF originally. He's now back as the director of GBIF in the Global Biodiversity Information Facility in Copenhagen, uh, which at the, national, at the international level aggregates over 400 million records. 
And he used to walk to work from his home up the top left and <laughs> to our office at Black Mountain. And uh, he was an avid recorder and a great, uh, a great interest in moth. Something else to note here, this is one of his images, but the image was placed up on Flickr, on the Encyclopedia of Life group, and it just demonstrates that as an infrastructure, as a system, we basically pull data from all sorts of different places. It doesn't need to be submitted directly to us, and that's a great advantage. There is a lot of data out there, um, and it can be harvested. It's very um, powerful to be able to draw upon the resources that's out there, rather than um, having to um, attract it all directly. So we looked at, given a particular species, show me something about a species. And the, the other question we answer is, give me a region and show me the biodiversity in a particular region. So in this case, these are bibliographic regions. I heard actually in the last, today and also the last few days, a few times, the desire to study the relationship between habitat and species. And if we've got, if you can classify habitats and create um, spatial, uh, geospatial layers associated with those habitats. Put them on a map. I've actually clicked on that particular region, which is the Mitchell Grass Downs. I've been uh, spreading from Northern Territory through Queensland. Um, and then as you go through the system, you can start to explore the biodiversity in, the, in that particular region. The other thing that, um, because we've got the species that are threatened tagged, within about two or three clicks from here, you'll be able to get a list of the species that are threatened in that particular region. Um, just going back slightly, because I forgot to mention us. Um, over here, on any species page, you've got recorder sighting and alerts. And that's quite important. Um, so we're inviting contributions from, from um, the public, from anybody who can basically use a system. The other aspect of this is if you've gone through this route and you've picked out all the threatened species in the Mitchell Grass Downs area, you'll also have the ability to set an alert and you'll get an email if a threatened species is recorded and provided to us in that particular region. So the alerts are very powerful and a very important communication tool um, and can keep people interested in and seeing what new data is coming through into the system. We also, then the third aspect of what the Atlas um, infrastructure can do uh, primarily is explore the relationship between species and a whole range of other factors, particularly climate, um, land use, and uh, this is where you know, habitat could also be in here. So on the, what we've got here is a magnificent creature and a great scientific name, Moloch Horridus. Uh, he's a thorny devil, so he's a great, uh, great creature there. Um, the blue dots show his um, distribution around Australia. This on the left-hand side is a scatter plot that looks at um, the distribution of this species um, as a, against temperature and precipitation. And the atlas has uh, over 400 layers in the system which allows this sort of um, analysis. And I think this is um, something that we've been able to do a little bit extra in that you can really touch and feel the data, you can really explore it and look at it in different ways. Um, so this, you know, we could be ex exploring the relationship of this species with a whole uh, different um, uh, range of, of factors, in, as I say, including land use and habitat. Um, what I'm showing here is a species. You can look at a at any um, level of the taxonomic hierarchy. So you can look at orders or class or genus, and start ex and look at images for all of uh, a whole range of uh, a genus level. That's a very powerful uh, identification tool as well. If you can just see all of the lizards that live in a particular area and use that as uh, an identification aid. Area reports um, are available. You can draw a polygon on the map and ask for a report and it'll tell you how many threatened species live in that area and you can then go and explore the, um, the range of that. It also, um, you can download a field guide and, and do all sorts of additional things with that information. Um, show the pests and weeds in that area as well. Um, I think I chose that one just to show that, yeah, it's it can be pretty harsh out there. Up the up at the northern, northwestern edge of Australia. But there is still, um, what did I find there? There was 308 threatened species in that particular area. Okay, so next uh, we do have a dashboard that um, helps uh, communicate as quickly as we can what's in the system, so 50 million records. Something that's uh, happening actively is a lot of downloads, so we're over two and a half billion dollar, um, records downloaded. One of the critical things about that, and I think it's my next slide, is that 
the, this sort of information about what's the activity on the system is being put back in the hands of the data providers. It's very important to us that the data providers are well supported and they're able to use these statistics to prove to their funding agencies, because it's such a wide network, there are many funding agencies involved for the original institutions. In this case, I'm looking at the Australian National Insect Collection, uh, and we've got some drawer images from them, so they're able to communicate to, their, to an audience about what's actually in the collection. Because these collections are uh, locked away, um, you, can't, you can't actually visit them. Um, number of institutions, and we'll see here that we've had, I'll pick out this one, this, 548 download events, um, and the users have given the reason that they're downloading for conservation management and planning purposes, and 93 million records have been downloaded from this particular data set. And that's a very powerful tool for that, for this particular institution to be able to indicate to uh, their stakeholders that their data is actually valuable. So it's proving very useful. Okay, so innovation story around the Atlas infrastructure. We're really one infrastructure but many systems can be built upon it. So basically, one way to express it is we shove all the data into one big bucket. So we can take occurrence data, images, sequence data, um, distributional information, expert distributions, and we're looking at phylogenies as well um, at the moment, literature, links. So basically, that's all in one uh, pool of infrastructure. It's, it's a technical term, but it's exposed through these web services, and from that, we can build the Atlas website itself, so that's built out of this infrastructure. We've built an uh, ocean bibliographic information system. We've built the Australian virtual herbarium, the uh, zoological collections of Australia. Um, there's a fish tool um, and also a bacterial um, portal and also a sea bank portal. So this is a bit of a hint as to how flexible the infrastructure is and it allows for a range of different views on top of the data. Something we've never actually had is a real design team. We've got a team of programmers, and we've we'll just hired someone with a, a, a graphic design background. So um, I saw some mock-ups yesterday of NBN's species pages and, and other pages, and they're looking very attractive. So we'll probably copy some of that ourselves as well. Um, there's new stuff keeps appearing. Um, there's a Greatest and Rangers portal, which is made up of a whole lot of um, partners in their own right, and we can just start to um, build these new portals on top of the existing infrastructure. There is an enormous interest internationally, particularly within the GBIF community. The Spanish portal is available now. It's not formally launched, but it will be soon. And similarly, there's portals coming from Costa Rica and Brazil. Argentina's interested and Malaysia was at a workshop recently. And this is making us um, pretty uh, proud to see the infrastructure reused in this way. Uh, we had a workshop um, in, a, in Canberra a few months back where we had some developers who progressed the code base to a point where it can be easily reinstallable. So that's the 10 million records coming through from the Spanish portal. And the interesting thing, immediately yesterday when I was showing it, is the number of records in the UK context. So it's amazing how, what, what happens when, when data is made visible um, through, through maps. So obviously, you know, repatriating that data into the NBN would be a magnificent um, um, outcome from, from this, and it could be done quite easily given that you can download the data immediately with a few clicks um, from the system. This was a fellow who approached me about a year and a half or two years ago, and it wasn't clear whether he was interested in a, uh, being, being provided some funding to build a tool or whether he was a commercial um, uh, wanting to sell a product. So we didn't actually engage too closely in the early stages. And as happens, he's built a great product called Quest Bird, um, and it's effectively gamifying or gamification of sightings. And he's, it's built upon the um, Atlas infrastructure. So it, it, it's something that's been built completely outside of our infrastructure, but uses all of the data that we provide. And one thing that's been leveraged here is that you get more points if you spot a rare bird. And the rarity of a bird is determined by the data that we have in the system. And given we've got um, 10 million plus records directly from Birds Australia, uh, an NGO in Australia, um, our bird data is very comprehensive. So it gives a good pointer to that. So it's pretty exciting um, what can happen. And this is, as I say, sort of an innovation that we hadn't expected. And it was mentioned by Ian Boyd this morning that um, part of innovation means people do things with data and systems that you didn't predict or you didn't uh, think of in the first place. And this is an example of that. 
So we've also see this used in, in other contexts. This is Monash University who are running um, continuous biodiversity surveys in the Jock Marshall Reserve and they've got built a website um, to attract you know, the public so the public can see what they're doing and also for their own students to um, um, use as a bit of a field guide for the species they may see there. And the species page looks remarkably similar to what we saw earlier. So they're basically drawing the images, the map, um, and information about a species directly from the Atlas uh, website. And it's been packaged up as their own, you know, the Jock Marshall Reserve site. Um, so that gives, it, gives them their own identity in that, in that space, and that's very important. Another one that's come through is what the BCCVL. It's a Biodiversity in a Changing Climate Virtual Laboratory. It was a, um, you know, um, a scientifically, um, it was further scientific infrastructure funded by through the, the government, but they were able to build this tool because the Atlas infrastructure exists and they, um, as per the other examples, they'd actually draw species data out of the Atlas and then pull it into their own modelling tools to produce models of um, where species may exist in the future based on various different climate change scenarios. The images, so this is a little bit difficult to see on the slide, but it's a pull down list of all acacia species we have in the system um, and allows the user to select which species they're going to include into their analysis. This was another project run out of uh, James Cook University up in Townsville, Australia, uh, called Project Edgar, which does something similar with um, species data and delivers a um, distribution range of species under different um, climatic conditions. Crowdsourcing is um, much bigger than we expected originally. Um, Digivol or a volunteer portal crowdsources transcriptions off labels or field notebooks. There's a lot of material still out there that um, cannot be read by machines, but it can be scanned. And this has been used as actually a Kew Gardens um, expedition in this system at the moment, but uh, it's used in South by South Africa. But basically, um, we're putting up um, handwritten labels. I think someone mentioned before there was a lady who did five million of labels earlier. And that's pretty impressive. So far we've had, um, we've got 762 volunteers engaged and 120,000 records transcribed for us. So that's working very well. We've ex also invested a lot in data capture, um, even though we don't have the same uh, community <laughs> that you have here. But um, these, this, this is data capture beyond straight species recording. This is infrastructure that allows us to record what's actually happening on the ground, what sort of uh, intervention activities are being conducted on the ground, whether it be uh, weeding or fencing or uh, feral management activity, threatened species management, um, a whole lot of what, what sort of plants are being planted, free vegetation or habitat restoration activity, where the seeds have come from for that activity. So it's also a bit of an information page. Um, this was just an example, so what they did get this, there is more than one dollar going into many of these projects. But there's sort of a project page which is used, been used by some communities as also a communication tool uh, within their group. Something that's coming through from this is the ability to report on the data and indeed start to measure real outcomes of what's happening on the ground. So has a particular restoration or conservation management activity actually delivered real outcomes on the ground? Um, interesting enough, the Australian Audit Office raised a flag, uh, it was a couple of years ago now, saying, look, we're spending all this money in the landscape, where's it going and what is the outcome of that investment? And this tool now is addressing that question. It's going to be a few years. I mean, we've, we've, it's been live since December. Um, great for us in that we've also got an additional 30,000 uh, observational records from this, from this particular group. So it's a great outcome for all. So how does that happen? At a technical level, it's all exposed to web services. Um, you guys actually have a number of systems like this as well that are uh, with a data and capability to expose through APIs, but um, there's that technical story behind that. So this was just an example of a tool that we built in collaboration with another e-research infrastructure and it brings together data from plot-based ecological surveys. And it's just an, it's an example of what happens when you can open up the data for exchange between systems. You can build new and innovative products on the web. So thank you very much. We've got time for a, a 
a question for Peter? Anybody there with a question? Oh, no. Thank you, Peter. Uh, so, Mark Stevenson from DEFRA. Can I just ask you about, you mentioned the Global Biodiversity Information Facility, GBIF. Can I just ask you to elaborate on the relationship with GBIF? And particularly, you referred to the, the bucket of Australian data. Is your bucket held nationally or is it held internationally and you, down, and you download? And how much, uh, a sort of added question, how much mm. are you using the kind of visualisation tools that come from GBIF? And do you think there's greater potential for the NBN gateway to do that kind of thing? So, okay, so start at the beginning. We, we are the official node for GBIF in Australia. Um, so we uh, contribute all of our records up to the GBIF node. We also do repatri re repatriate or download data from the GBIF node back into the Australian context. So we do have infrastructure that sits in Australia. So we've built the system um, and it's now, as I say, being reused by other GBIF nodes around the world. Um, now I'm going to forget the, the second, third and fourth part the, of the... Just about the, the, tool, the tools and services that yep. GBIF provides, okay. particularly the web visualisation tools. Are you, you, have you so developed your own or used yep. those? I, I think that it's clear to say the, um, you know, the Atlas system was informed strongly by the original GBIF tools as well as a range of other systems that have been built over the years. Um, GBIF have built their own infrastructure but now they're also getting to a point where they're officially supporting the Atlas infrastructure um, as, an, a, as a coordination point for those countries who do want to take up and reinstall uh, components of the Atlas. So they're taking up a role of assisting others. And they've also been helping us with some documentation, which has been very really useful. Good. Thanks, Peter. Thank you. That's great. Right, um, now we've, I don't think we've, in the 14 years of having NBN conferences, I don't think we've ever, we've ever tried this kind of speed dating, uh, speed talk kind of approach to uh, presenting information, but we've got four very important stories to be told over 20 minutes. Um, so um, each speaker, uh, I'll, I'll give them a, a wave at, at four minutes, but um, uh, they've each got five minutes to, to impart some information. But we thought it'd be good to get you inspired and then have, uh, you can approach them after, after their talk over lunch. Um, uh, which we've got coming up after the straight after. So, um, the first uh, the first uh, speaker we've got is um, uh, John Tweddle from the Natural History Museum, uh, talking about introducing the identification trainers for the future project. Thank you. Okay, let's see if this format works. So, I'm going to start my own stopwatch for five minutes to see how we go. Okay, it's a great pleasure to be here today to introduce a project that we're really excited about, called Identification Trainers for the Future. Um, it's a new work-based training programme that's led by the museum um, and what we're really trying to do is support people who are early career scientists. They're looking to develop a career within the UK biodiversity sector, it's the sector we're all part of. We're working with those who are just starting out in their career because we think that's where we can give the greatest jump up the ladder if you like. Um, this could be people straight from schools, straight from university or it could be people later in life who are changing their career. Um, the key thing is we're trying to pick up people that are passionate about this kind of career choice and work from there. So we're doing this as part of the museum's role in particular to do something proactive to tackle the skills decline we've been talking about for years, and particularly looking to support UK biodiversity identification, recording and associated museum skills, so the ability to develop and handle reference collections that are so important for some groups. Partnership with the Field Studies Council and NBN Trust and it's funded through the Heritage Lottery Fund, who are particularly keen to support skills within the natural heritage se sector more generally, so we're grateful for their funding. There's a lot to the project, I haven't got much time, so I'm going to focus on the core part, which is 15, 12 months long training placements based primarily at the museum. And trainees will be supported through this with um, effectively a PhD stipend to cover the living wage. So, this isn't everything, um, but to give you an example of the kind of work they'll be involved in, um, they'll be going through a four-phase programme, which will support them to, we hope, steadily develop their skills, confidence and expertise in a way that ultimately will help them to document, monitor and help us understand how the UK's biodiversity is changing at this critical time. It's a work-based training programme, so if you look on the right-hand side, um, they'll complete a number of work placements directly with our teams at the museum, so whether that's in the Centre for UK Biodiversity and with our specialist curators, 
or with our learning engagement teams and the Field Studies Council. Um, this, this, the latter two are, are really exciting to me, and I think this is a bit that I like most about the project. Because we can work with 15 trainees, we can train them up and support them to a high standard in identification recording, for example, as much as you can in a year. But that's just 15 people, so we're looking at how we can create a multiplier effect. What we're really trying to do is support these trainees to actually gain the confidence and the skills to communicate their skills, communicate their passion for this subject, and to train others. And that's the experimental area, so we'll see how that goes. On the left, you'll see there's a wide range of training that will run alongside their work placements. Um, I picked some of the taxonomic groups that will be trained in there. That's not inclusive. Um, we're really focusing on the species groups that you need for wildlife surveys, so flowering plants are a critical group there, plus those that we know um, are perhaps less recorded. There are fewer skilled people in um, those taxonomic groups, so lower plants, fungi, lichens, and a lot of the entomological groups. So that's <laughs> a real whistle-stop tour of what the trainees will be doing. Um, there are other elements to the project too. So alongside the formal training we'll be giving, we'll be inviting other people in to share that training as well. Um, so up to 1,000 people will come through our training courses over three years. We'll produce a lot of identification resources, which will be made freely available online as well. Um, the trainees will create a lot of these, so it'll be quite a good experiment, um, particularly video masterclasses in the field, that side of things. And I think in common with a lot of us in the room, we're really concerned about how we can really broaden the relevance of the subject we're all passionate about. I mean, we know we're interested, we know the value. How can we encourage more people to both know that it's an important job role and also it's something for them? So we're running a couple of pilot studies looking at workforce diversity within the sector and also new ways of recruiting that are perhaps more open. So these are experimental. We can't nail that in three years, but we're going to try a few different approaches and see what works. Uh, and the final point really on this I wanted to make is that this, this is one project in amongst a number of others that are work, operating across the country. We're really keen to collaborate. Um, we, we're just starting out. Um, the more we can do to work with your groups, whether that's the voluntary sector, amateur expert naturalists, or whether it's professional sector, come and chat to us. If you're interested in these areas, you're doing similar work programs, and we'll try and join up where we possibly can. Certainly don't want to duplicate efforts. Um, so, my time is probably out. I'm going to leave you with a final slide, which is basically saying applications are now open for the first round of trainees. So there'll be five trainees starting in March next year. Um, we've had a huge amount of interest, but please spread the word. If you know of anyone this might appeal to, and then please do uh, let them know. We're around all day, yeah? Um, so just come and chat to us. There are a group of us. We've got to stand next door or visit our website. And that must be five minutes. It's <laughs> all cool. so, right. Four minutes with two. <laughs> We won't take any questions, but that, that's how to do a five-minute talk. So uh, very impressed, and um, we'll move on to the next one. Um, we now have uh, Laurie Lawson Handley um, from the University of Hull talking about how will the molecular revolution contribute to biological recording. Okay, thank you very much indeed for the opportunity to come and talk to you today about um, how the molecular revolution could possibly um, contribute to biological recording. So in the 1960s, the makers of Star Trek came up with the idea of a tricorder. And some of you may know that Spock used that um, to describe biodiversity in different habitats on, on different planets. Nowadays, that's actually becoming quite close to reality with um, the advent of next generation sequencing. So what we can do now is generate up to about 1.8 terabases of DNA in a single run of a next generation sequencer. So in the last 10 years, the throughput of these machines has increased enormously while the price has plummeted. And now it's looking like it might be possible to devise something like a tricorder in the next few years with the advent of handheld devices such as the Minion from, uh, from Nanopore. So um, how does this fit with biological recording? Well, um, I'm sure all of us in the room um, enjoy using traditional methods, and we're, they, they are all um, uh, most effective when species are, are uh, relatively easy to find and, and recognise. Um, but it's a bit more tricky when you've got species that have got similar morphology, require specialist training to identify, have similar juvenile stages, or are rare and elusive. So that's where the molecular techniques come in as a complementary approach, not an alternative approach, but a complementary approach um, to uh, trying to tackle some of these issues. 
And environmental DNA, as was mentioned by Ian Boyd this morning, is arguably the biggest game changer in this area. So I'm going to concentrate the rest of my talk on environmental or eDNA. So the approach for analysing eDNA is first of all to choose your environment and um, then to take a sample um, of your environment. So in its strictest sense, eDNA refers to the free-floating DNA um, that comes from things like the um, slough cells, um, faeces, urine, gametes or decaying matter in the environment. But actually the term's also quite loosely used to include um, microscopic taxa that are present. So essentially you take a sample of water, very simply, or whichever other your environment you're, you're interested in. It's also applicable to soil and air. And you filter it and extract the DNA. And then you have the options of two different approaches. In eDNA, met uh, sorry, in eDNA barcoding, you're targeting single or a few species, um, amplifying them using traditional um, uh, PCR and sequencing methods. Whereas in eDNA metabarcoding, you're essentially screening the whole community with um, a combination of, of different um, uh, uh, conserved primers, and these are analysed using these next generation sequencing uh, methods that I mentioned in the last slide. So you're essentially describing a whole community with this approach. So now I just want to run through three different types of applications of eDNA, and the first is in monitoring biodiversity. So, um, uh, one study um, by a Danish group a few years ago uh, targeted six different species in uh, still and flowing water, and what they found was that eDNA detection rates were between about 80 and 100% in the still waters, but slightly more difficult in the flowing waters. But even in the flowing waters, the, 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 um, uh, the detection rate was quite comparable to traditional methods. And a similar result was recently found um, in a lovely study that was carried out um, on great crested newts, um, led by the Freshwater Habitat Trust. So essentially they found that the detection rate um, from eDNA was, um, was better than any of the other methods that are currently used. And the same, group as, uh, the same Danish group as before also did a, a study on marine biodiversity, and they detected 15 species just from taking three half-litre water samples and their, um, uh, their methods outperformed all of the traditional methods apart from the night snorkelling, which was considerably more time-consuming, um, uh, as you can imagine. So something I'm very interested in is invasive species. Um, eDNA has been, uh, had very good detection rates for American bullfrog, and it's also demonstrated um, uh, that uh, silver and big-head carp were able to um, get over the electric barriers um, that were put up to prevent them entering the Great Lakes. And it's also very interesting for the um, possibility of invasion pathways. It's also been used to detect records within records. So, for example, um, Vietnamese leeches were used um, to identify very, very difficult species um, uh, uh, over there. And this kind of air, um, avenue of research is really taking off the idea of um, molecular food webs to um, in investigate these complex ecological interactions. So to this end, um, so um, just to briefly summarise, so eDNA is providing a very sensitive, um, accurate detection of, of rare species and outperforming a lot of traditional methods. Um, it's quite um, surprisingly um, uh, cost effective, but we've still got lots and lots to learn before we can really employ this technology to get the most out of it. So to this end, we're part of a UK network that's um, trying to uh, um, uh, make all this joined up um, and use this technology more effectively. Um, these are the organisations that are involved in that network, and I'd be really happy to hear of anyone else that's interested in joining the network um, today. Thank you very much for your, your attention. Very impressive. Right, um, so the next, um, next presentation we have is um, Chris Raper from the uh, Natural History Museum. He's the UK Species Inventory Manager, and he's going to be talking about what's next for the, for the inventory. Thanks, Chris. Okay, this is very daunting. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, as you've heard, I've been invited along to speak about the uh, UK Species Inventory. Uh, many of the people in the audience will... Uh, recognise me and, and know me from that role, but uh, for those that don't uh, know, know me or know about the UK Species Inventory, I thought I'd just start by outlining a little bit about the project. Um, it's uh, simply a database of all the names of all the UK wildlife 
uh, British Wildlife. And uh, it does some complex things to resolve the names of uh, common species, common names, scientific names, uh, down to taxonomic concepts, which is very useful if you're the NVN gateway because it means that records can be sent in uh, for common names, scientific names, Welsh names, Scottish names, and it can all be resolved to a single map and uh, you understand, even if a name changes, which taxonomic concept you're talking about. Um, it's a partnership between uh, the NBN family of projects, uh, Natural History Museum being a member of that. Uh, so the actual data is used by the NBN Gateway, Recorder 6, uh, iRecord, iSpot, just to name but a few. There's a, a lot of users of the data. And uh, it's, uh, it's not formatted up my slide very well, has it? Um, it's uh, a network, uh, the data comes from a network of contributors, uh, amateurs and professionals uh, ta expert taxonom taxonomists in their own field and uh, I can't see what I was going to say after that now so there we go um, <laughs> um, you can just see a little example there that uh, this is from what my own uh, uh, sandbox website where I've searched for grayling and it's brought out two taxonomic uh, concepts and uh, sort of given us the latest scientific name roughly the grouping and all the names that have been um, given to us for those different concepts. So when somebody types a record into iRecord, they know which, whether they're recording a fish or a butterfly. Um, how did I get here? Um, well, just that's very boring, but uh, I worked a lot of years in uh, IT. I've been running a recording scheme for Tekinid Flies, and uh, I've been a recorder for over 25 years, and I'm just really lucky. <laughs> Um, my approach has been to speed up the response to requests so that when people request a name to go into the database, it gets in very, very quickly and there's no long delays between these things uh, going in and being able to be mapped because obviously the things that are new, things like quagga muscle and things like this, as soon as they appear on the scene, people want to map them and they want to get the records in quickly. So I've been streamlining that. Um, I was also brought in to plan a, a technical direction and um, as part of that, what I want to move on to is the transition from using a current, the current system which is an access database and I'd like to bring the whole system online and uh, allow the users of the data to actually interact with it and um, provide suggestions for changes, spot where there's mistakes because there are plenty of those. Um, I spend my day sort of um, with people suggesting uh, amendments to the data and um, so Part of that, it's, it's a long way off at the moment, but uh, I'm sort of pushing and pushing for it to happen. John's nodding, so it, it will happen. <laughs> um, but the, the whole point being that it will become a, not so much a crowdsourced system, but the uh, information, people will be able to suggest things to me, and then I'll be able to approve that information, as well as going out and spending more time than sourcing uh, checklists and sourcing data for groups that we don't uh, have very well covered at the moment. Um, and uh, yeah, being available um, as well. I, I'm, I come to all of these um, conferences and workshops and just make sure that people can contact me if there's anything that uh, needs to be changed in the data. If you see a species that's um, not in the system or it's using the wrong name, then get in touch with me. Um, very easy to get hold of. And um, I just want to try and make sure that the data is as up to date as possible and uh, allow people to have the uh, uh, direct access to their data so that um, there's no Chinese whispers as information is passed on down the line to me. And, oh, there's our, our partners that we work with. So you can see the data goes into the NBN, obviously, in this year, I record, JNCC recorder, iSpot. I'm rambling now, here we go. And uh, if there's any more questions, um, meet me in the foyer and uh, chat about things. Cheers. <laughs>very good Chris thanks very much um, our last one before lunch so hopefully he sticks to the five minutes is uh, Charles Roper uh, from he's the technical lead from the Sussex Biodiversity Record Centre and he's talking about open data the future of data sharing so take a look. right thank you for giving me this opportunity to speak um, 25 years ago this year Tim Berners-Lee created the World Wide Web 
A key design element of the web is openness and accessibility. No one company controls it, and anyone with the right equipment can access information on it and publish to it for free, no permission required. It's a quality we now take for granted, but it was by no means a foregone conclusion. It takes a lot of commitment to be this open. The intervening years have brought about a knowledge revolution. The web has changed the way we work, learn, love, live, think, consume, and we're only just getting started. We're in the midst of a data bloom. Data is the raw material of the information economy, the digital building blocks of our age. Yet it's often difficult to find, combine, and work with the cacophony of disparate data that's out there. But do it we must if we are to extract maximum value and maximum insight. Data in isolation, unknown or unused, is not reaching its full potential. And so for the second decade of the web's existence, Sir Tim and the web community at large have been working on the idea of linked data. Essentially, linked data is a way of bridging the gaps between databases on the web using common standards and identifiers so that they may be collectively mined for information and combined into ad hoc composite data sets and put to unexpected uses. It's a powerful idea. Over the last few years, linked data sets have been burgeoning. The Linked Data Open Cloud website tracks progress. In 2007, we tracked just 12 linked data sets. As we step through the years, we see growth is clear, mirroring the early days of the traditional website. This is the picture as of 2014. We have 570 tracked linked open data websites. These images speak for themselves. Each node is a distinct, often vast database. In the middle there, we have DBpedia, which is a database-ized version of Wikipedia. As a community dedicated to the gathering of information about our natural environment, it is essential that we consider now how we are to become a part of this picture so that we may properly honour the importance of biodiversity to our existence. To neglect this new chapter of the web's evolution puts us at risk of being ignored, akin to a filing cabinet full of old notebooks, which is to say not redundant, just very inaccessible and inconvenient and therefore easy to overlook. Thankfully, we are not alone. The open data movement started quietly a decade ago with the intention of addressing these issues and in the last two years has exploded. Governments, NGOs, companies and citizens around the world have sat up and are paying attention and are getting involved. Minds are moving and funds are flowing. The UK leads the way in the formation of the Open Data Institute, not only galvanised the community but has begun to catalyse demand. Open data is at the stage the web was at 20 years ago. It is an idea whose time has come. A recent McKinsey report identified more than $3 trillion in economic value globally through the use of open data. Never mind big data, that's big money. And so, as the title of this brief talk suggests, I believe open data is the future of data sharing. We do, do not need to open all data. We can start small, experiment and learn, and of course some data must remain proprietary, but other data, perhaps most data, we can open bit by bit. So as every journey starts with one step, so too must we take our first steps. The technical, legal and economic processes involved in opening data can be seen as a benchmark, a set of best practices to guide our way. Good open data is liquid, it flows, it can be linked to and talked about, it is standardised and structured, it is available and accessible, and it is traceable to its origin. For every project we should ask ourselves, how can we make the data open? This should be the default thought on our minds when considering any data initiative. It won't always be possible, but often it will. And this is what we should be striving for. This is the open way. So, 
If you're interested in learning more, I suggest starting with the ODI, the Open Data Institute, who offer useful guides and training. You can also contact me. I'm on Twitter. I've been tweeting today, in fact. And you could email me if you like to use the slightly more old-fashioned methods of contact. <laughs> I look forward to hearing from you. Thank you.